Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us this evening for a conversation with Naima Koster and Christina Baker Klein to discuss Naima's excellent new novel, What's Mine and Yours. My name is Talia. I'm the events manager here at Flyly. And before we begin, I'd just like to encourage y'all to check out our full events calendar. This season includes a little bit of everything from culinary justice to pollinator gardening and novels ranging from literary fiction to domestic thriller and romance. So no matter what you're into, you can find something to watch with us and you can access all of our past event recordings. Um, just click on our logo at the top of your screen where it says Flyleaf Books and you can find all of our upcoming events as well as all of our past events. If you'd like to support Flyleaf and our guests, please keep in mind that you can order What's Mine and Yours as well as past titles from Naima and Christina by clicking the button below our faces. We are also once again open for in-person browsing. So if you're local, you can stop by Monday through Saturday from 11 to five and shop with us in person. Without further ado, I will go ahead and introduce our guest tonight. Christina, ba sorry, Christina Baker Klein is the number one New York Times bestselling author of eight novels, including Orphan Train, A Piece of the World, and most recently, The Exiles. Her novels have been awarded the New England Prize for Fiction, the Maine Literary Award, and a Barnes & Noble Discover Award, among other accolades, and have been chosen by hundreds of communities, universities, and schools as a one-book, one-read selection. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times and the New York Times Book Review, among other places. Born in England and raised in the American South and Maine, she lives in New York City and on Mount Desert Island in Maine. Christina, welcome. Thank you. Delighted to be here. <laughs> And our star tonight, Naima Koster, is the author of Halsey Street and a finalist for the 2018 Kirkus Prize for Fiction. Naima's stories and essays have appeared in the New York Times, Quelly, the Paris Review Daily, and elsewhere. She holds an MFA in creative writing from Columbia University, as well as degrees from Fordham University and Yale. She has taught writing for over a decade in community settings, youth programs, and universities. She lives in Brooklyn with her family. Her new book is What's Mine and Yours. Welcome, Naima, and congratulations on your pub day. Thank you so much for having me, and thanks to Christina for being here for our conversation. I'm so excited so to be here. So excited. Um, I'm going to hop out and keep the focus okay. on both of you. Whenever you're ready for audience questions, just let me know, and I'll pop back up to read those out. Sounds Perfect. good. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. So first of all, I want to say um, that I'm so grateful um, to Flyleaf and um, for this opportunity. I know that Naima is as well, and um, I'm just delighted to be here tonight because um, I wrote about this today on Facebook and Instagram, so some of you may have seen it, but I was writer in residence at Fordham when I was lucky to have this incredible grad student in my master's class in creative writing. And I think, I don't remember if we did one or two classes together. Was it two? Yeah. And from the minute um, Naima opened her mouth, um, I felt like I had a tea. I, I remember going home to my husband and I had young children and I was overwhelmed with life. And I just said, I feel like I have a TA, a teaching assistant in my class. Like this oh. woman is amazing. And then to have on top of it, the most gorgeous writing was astounding. And I knew, I just knew, Naima, that you were going to be a star. I think I told you that from the very beginning. I was your biggest cheerleader. So I'm thrilled to be here. And um, it's been delightful to watch you flourish and grow. And Halsey Street was so fantastic, your first novel. And you've even done a more ambitious, deep, resonant, powerful, um, uh, culturally important novel this time around. And the response to it has been overwhelming, which I'll talk about after I let you talk. Um, I'm going to let you talk in a sec. Um, but I just wanted to introduce you by saying that I feel so honored to be here and that one of the great joys of being a teacher is that every now and then you get a student who just completely astonishes you. And that is what happened for me with Naima. So this is sort of a, a dream come true for me, I think. Oh, thank you so much. So, so do you want, so what I think might be a good idea is if you kind of introduce your novel by 
saying a few words about it for people who haven't read it. Some people haven't read it yet. It's just out. Um, and then doing a reading, if you would like, um, for a few minutes to give people a taste of the story. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Um, and I'll also say before I dive into the reading that um, it was Christina who first encouraged me to write a novel. So this is a lovely celebration for me too. Um, I always thought a novel was something I would do one day when I was ready. Um, and it was Christina who said to me, maybe it's time to start, start now, um, you're ready. And that's, and that's how I started Halsey Street. So this, this night has a lot of meaning for me too. All right, so What's Mine and Yours started with a short story called Cold that I wrote shortly after moving to North Carolina. It's a story about a woman named Lacey May who's struggling financially and is trying to find a way to keep the heat on for her girls while her husband Robbie is in and out of their lives and is struggling with addiction. And that story was about the lengths that a mother will go to to secure the future of her children and it became the seed of this novel. The book also focuses on another mother who I was interested in, a woman named Jade who suffers a terrible loss and tries to find new reasons for living when her dreams for her life change and are interrupted. And her dreams have to do with herself. She's an ambitious woman who wants a professional life. And they also have to do with her son, G, who's a sensitive, anxious young man who's already lost too much. And the two mothers, come into contact, they collide with one another when a local high school in a city set in the Piedmont of North Carolina um, becomes integrated. And the choices that the mother make yield consequences for them, their relationships with their children, and the way that the children relate with one another. Um, and the book takes place over three decades and moves between these two families following the children when they're young and then also into adulthood. Um, and uh, I'm gonna read today from pretty early in the novel. I, I wanna introduce those of you who are here to the character of Jade and um, her partner, Ray. And so the book begins with Ray on an important day for him at a bakery in the downtown of this city called Superfine. He's waiting for a reporter to come and write a story about the bakery that he hopes will change his life and change the life of his girlfriend Jade and their son G. And so I'm going to read a little bit and then we'll chat. All right. The shop was full when Jade burst into super fine, her sunglasses on, her hair folded into a side braid already coming apart at the ends. She was still wearing the gray leggings and bad brains t-shirt she'd slept in underneath a tan trench coat. She leapt up to kiss her and Jade let him and then held him away and asked where she could find Ray. Why'd you take him? She asked as Ray emerged from behind the counter. Her voice was high and thin, and the customers turned in their seats to look at them. I know how to take care of my son. Ray took her by the arm and steered her out to the street. You all right? My head, Jade said, pressing her fingers to her temples. She didn't explain where she'd been last night, but Ray could figure. There was a restaurant off the freeway that she liked to go to with the girls from her class. They served frozen Jack and Cokes. I had an alarm set. I was ready to take him but I woke up and everybody was gone. I didn't want him to miss another day of school. I would have done it, she said. Jade pushed her sunglasses up and he saw last night's eyeliner thick around her downturned eyes. Her nails were painted black and she was wearing her lace up boots. How pretty she was, how small, was all the more obvious in her dark clunky clothes. He'd seen the pictures of her from high school right before she got pregnant with G. A black girl goth who read comic books and hung out with nerds, dreamed about going to punk shows out of town if she could ever find a ride. It was a much older boy who'd gotten her pregnant, someone at the community college where she was taking a math class. He'd wanted nothing to do with G, so Jade lived with her mother until she met Ray and he said to her, let's find a place, the three of us. Jade stared at him as if she were thinking of apologizing. Did that reporter come by yet? Ray could sense her mood shifting. She was penitent, maybe because she wanted him to bake the best he ever had and impress that reporter, or maybe there was no reason at all. 
Sometimes Jade was tender, gathering up Ray and G in her arms, declaring how lucky she was to have a family that loved her. Other times she tore through the house, kicking things that were out of place and going on about how she hated living all cooped up and she hated her dinged up car and she hated that G was never quiet when she had to study, when she had two hours to sleep before her shift. We're just watching the door, Ray said. He's supposed to come before three. I've got an exam today too, Jade said, drawing blood. I was going to practice on you last night, but I lost track of time. You were gonna come home and stick a needle in me, even if you couldn't see straight? Jade laughed and covered half of her face with her hand. I was going to pretend to stick you. You can pretend later, tonight. You can show me how after you've aced it. Why are you so sweet to me, Raymond? Ray leaned toward Jade and kissed her. She smelled of the musty couch where she'd fallen asleep, her rose perfume, the cream she rubbed on after a shower in the bathroom with her limbs spread wide. She was all ribs and small breasts, a brush of hair between her legs. Ray groaned a little without meaning to, thinking of her. They had been missing their time together lately. Jade hard asleep in the mornings before he left for the shop. Lynette could say what she wanted about Jade, but she deserved at least some respect. None of her people had gone to school and here she was pushing, making a way. Who could blame her if sometimes she needed a break to go out and have a few drinks? Ray kissed her again. You deserve all the sweet things in life, he said, and went inside to collect G. When they returned, Jade had her headphones on, a song roaring in her ears. Ray handed her a coffee and a devil's food donut, then kissed his boy two, three, four times. Come and meet us after your shift, Jade said. We'll be at Wilson's house, he called for a favor. What's he want? Help moving furniture or something. He can't ask one of his boys to do that? Jade shrugged. I never ask Wilson questions. I don't like you going over there alone. Wilson lived in a rough corner of the east side, but it wasn't just the neighborhood that bothered Ray. Wilson was the sort of man who lied about the plainest things, how much he'd paid for a microwave, why he'd been fired from his last job. He teased G for his missing tooth, slapped Jade's behind to say hello and goodbye. More than once, Ray had run interference for Wilson after he started an argument at a bar. More than once, they'd lent him cash they'd needed themselves. But Jade tolerated him because he was her cousin and he'd been good to her. He bought her beers when she was 16, taking her to appointments when she was pregnant with G. Did he ask you to bring money? Who else is going to be over there? You worry too much, Jade said and kissed Ray goodbye. She pulled G along by the hand and the boy leaned into his mother, content to finally have her eyes on him. Ray watched them walk to the corner. He felt distinctly that he was watching his whole life move away from him. The slender shape of Jade and her must hair, G's backpack immense on his little body. He wanted to run after them and draw them back, keep them in the shop where he could protect them. From what? From Wilson? Ray knew it didn't make sense. These urges he got sometimes to hold everything he loved close. The occasional shock of how much he had to lose. Maybe he was nervous the reporter wouldn't like his donuts. Maybe he poured himself too many cups of coffee. He moved to follow them, to give Jade another kiss, his boy another squeeze, but he knew it was just nerves. He stayed put. By sundown, they'd all be back at home. And I'll pause there. Wonderful, I could listen to you read the rest. <laughs> um, you know, I'm struck um, as you're reading by what so many people have said about the book um, over and over again, I was noticing, I went through a bunch of your reviews today and responses to the book. And I was noticing that the same word kept coming up again and again. I don't know if you've noticed this, but the word is tender. Um, and I was thinking as you were reading that there's a way in which uh, that, that you're building tension as the story goes along, that we feel this ratcheting up, that there's something ahead that's going to be, um, you know, things are going to come to a head. Uh, but at the same time, we're very close to the characters and um, we, we sort of feel what they're feeling. And, and talk, can you talk a little bit about that? Um, it's interesting to me that that's a word that people use. And I was thinking it myself as I was listening to you. Yeah. Well, I, I think a lot about the dreams that are dear to my characters. 
the things that they're hoping for, the things that they long for. And I try to render that in as much detail as I can. And sometimes the things that they long for aren't particularly good for them. You know, the character of Ray is someone who has a dream for a better life for his family, for harmony with his girlfriend and their son. Um, but there are other characters in the book like the, the woman Lacey May, who's at the center of the other family, um, who longs for a relationship and a romance that isn't particularly good for her or good for her daughters. But I think a lot about those longings um, and the actions and places that they, they drive us to. You have a big cast of characters, but the novel feels quite intimate. Um, and I wonder how you started. Where did it come from? What was the germ of this story for you? Well, I think that this book is maybe three projects collapsed into one that became one project. So there was the short story that I mentioned, Cole's about Lacey May and her husband, Robbie, and their three daughters, Noelle, Margarita, and Diane. And I thought that that was just a standalone story that I wrote to pass three very cold and lonely days that I spent snowed into my house in North Carolina. Um, and I knew that I wanted to write about a woman who was wondering if she happened to be pregnant after um, a loss, a tragedy. Um, and that, that was the woman Jade. And I didn't know if I'd write a story about her or a novel. And then I knew I wanted to write a book about integration and the way that it would ripple through a community. And so at some point I said to myself, well, I have these two interesting characters sitting around and I already write, want to write a book from different points of view. Maybe I'll bring them together into this novel. And instead of rotating through several families in a community, really focus on these two and the ways that they become entangled. Is that process, that creative process, something that you have, is that how Halsey Street developed as well, your other novel, your first novel? Or is it, does it feel like this sort of happened with this book, this pulling together of pieces from different parts of your um, creative imagination? Mm -hmm. Well, I think with Halsey Street, I also similarly had a situation, like I was interested in the situation of gentrification and homecoming. Um, and that gave me sort of my character Penelope. And I didn't expect that book to have two points of view. I didn't expect to write from her mother Mireya's point of view, um, but I sort of found her calling me. And so I think something similar happened here where I'm, I'm very interested in what's going on in the lives that we can't see that mm -hmm. affects our own experience. You know, like in any family system, every member has their own life and we don't know everyone's secrets or histories, but we feel the effects of their stories in the collective life of a family. So maybe I will always write from multiple points of view. Maybe I won't. Yeah. Well, what's uh, interesting is that it, uh, it's a double-edged sword because people can be turned off by multiple perspectives because they feel there's too much to keep track of. But you did such a beautiful job of delineating characters. So we, I think we felt very much that we are in, the, the reader is in the hands of someone who, um, who who's going to, um, the shift will be clear. There's not, it, there's not confusion. What did it take for you writing to do that? How, you know, did you revise a lot? How did that come together? Yeah, I'd say about half of the time that I was working on this book was just thinking time. Like I was thinking about it and putting together scraps of notes for two years. And then I drafted it in a year while I was pregnant. Um, with my daughter, and then I revised it in the first year of her life. So it was all together four years, but those first two years were just sort of letting ideas circulate and questioning what kind of book it would be. And then the drafting was quite quick, and then the revision took just as long. <laughs> right. Were you, was there a certain point where you sort of hoped that you were done and then you d had to dig back in? Oh, yeah. Reason? Yeah, absolutely. And I think my editor is listening to this, so this will be familiar to her. Um, I thought that I turned in the final version of the book in late February of 2020. So sort of just as things were beginning um, right. to shift here with, with COVID. And so I thought that I was done with the book, um, but I wasn't. 
we had to do sort of one more one more round and so i was working on it in those early months of the pandemic which was very hard very hard and so what did you pull on to get that draft done because i've had the same experience where i just thought i would kill myself if i had to look at one more page of my if i had to dig back in again and tear it apart and put it back together yeah um, how, did you, how did you dredge up the the will to do that well you know the honest answer is like maybe i'm a little too accustomed to that sort of like working under duress or like showing up under duress which is something that comes up in the book in some ways like yes. um like the character of g when he enters the largely white central high school um is learning ways to sort of live with pressure um, and step up under pressure. So there's something very old about my kind of attitude of just buckling down and getting it done. Um, but I think that what sort of kept me from burning out um, was like support and sustenance from people in my life who, who love me and support me. And I really do think that writing a book is in some ways an act of emotional endurance, not to pat myself too much on the back here. <laughs> um, and I think helpful. any writers, um, I see Barbara Claypool White is here, I'm sure she would agree with us that um, that, uh, that is true, that it is an act of endurance. Yeah, so just having, having friends and supportive loved ones who sort of, checked in and sort of filled up my emotional tank at a time when there was a many there were many reasons to feel depleted yeah definitely and actually i was thinking Naima, as you were talking that um you and i both went to yale and if there's anything i learned from that experience it is just the hard hard work of digging in and um revise i mean you know that i think that's where i really learned to to pull all nighters and get the work done. I don't pull all nighters anymore if I can help it, but you know, mm -hmm. that kind of work ethic that I feel like I really learned there. Um, so, oh my gosh, this book has gotten so many accolades already. So it's book of the month club. It's the Jenna pick. Um, you've gotten, it's number one. I saw a new release in coming of age fiction. On yeah. Amazon. Interesting. And I want to talk to you about that coming of age. Um, you've been compared to Celeste Eng and Ann Patchett and Jacqueline Woodson. Um, your first novel was absolutely beautiful. Um, I loved it. But this is a whole different publishing experience. So what is it like? What has that been like for you so far? I know we're just starting, but you still, you know, in those early, in those months building up, you kind of get a sense of what's mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's been totally thrilling um, and has, you know, exceeded my expectations. I don't take it lightly that anyone would want to read my book and spend time with it because novels in particular are big investments. They're big investments yeah. of time and emotional energy. Um, so I'm thrilled when people want to read and allow my book to be company to them. I will say that the Read with Jenna announcement was a little surreal. I knew it was coming but it was still wonderful. I watched it today as part of the Oh, research. yeah, yeah. Um, but she was so over the moon about your book. And I actually did the Read with Jenna pick last month with um, my dear friend, Lauren Fox. Um, and then also Kristen Hanna, there was a twofer last month for some yeah. reason. But, um, but today she was almost giddy with excitement or maybe yesterday, whenever it was. Um, but it was really exciting to see. What was it that felt surreal to you about it? Well, I think it was surreal to have the book featured on the Today Show and a familiar figure to, to resonate with it. And, you know, the book is a work of fiction, but in some ways it is so deeply personal and comes from such deep wells that to hear someone you don't know talk about it with such insight and perceptiveness um, feels like a window into the book, but also a window into my mind um, and the yeah, things that really matter to me. I think for people who are aspiring to write, um, that is one of the joys that you don't really even kind of know until it happens, which is that you feel some piece of you is being validated by by people who, by reviewers who read it and like it or, or point something out to you that feels very, as you said, um, very much like sort of personal to your own experience. 
Um, and I think she did do that. And one of the things I thought was interesting is the other co-hosts or whatever were sort of like talking about watching detective shows and, you know, and she was saying this novel, you got to read it instead of watching a series because it will transport you in the same way. And I actually had the same experience reading this book. And I wondered about pacing, about the way you pace the book, because it actually moves along very quickly. Mm -hmm. did, was that something you thought of consciously as you were working? It is. And, you know, for, for writers who are with us and who are listening, I think, you know, one of the things that I think all writers face is, you know, the point in your practice where you have to teach yourself how to do the next thing that you don't know how to do. You have to teach yourself how, right. how to write your book. Um, and I think that I knew that a book with such complicated questions and complicated timeline and so many characters had to have some sort of thread that would move us along or multiple threads. So I tried to approach each chapter in a way that felt energetic so that something was moving in that discrete section of the book and also something accumulating for the whole book. I am not a short story writer, but I tried to use my short story muscles yeah. chapter to that. chapter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm reading the George Saunders book, the amazing George Saunders book about Russian literature called A Swim in the Pond in the Rain. And he takes seven um, short stories by Russian masters and he breaks them down and mm -hmm. talks about how they're written, what writers can learn, what readers can learn from them. And one of the things he talks about is exactly this idea that you're... Um, that every sentence in, in a story, but I actually think a novel too serves two functions. And one function is that it is it is part, you know, it's part of the narrative, of course, and it's doing all that work of being beautiful, you hope, and having and resonating in the story. But on another level, it is it has to be fundamentally important to the story itself, you know, so that no sentence is sort of wasted in the story. And I love that idea. And I had that feeling reading your novel that you know, you're, you're doing that dual work all the time of telling a story that's resonant, interesting, uh, topical, et cetera. And you're also um, always aware of moving the story forward and moving along. Well, um, I'll also say, of, oh, oh, go ahead and then I'll ask I was just going to say, I also think this is something that I learned from you and that you emphasize huh. certainly and is, and is true <laughs> of, of your most recent book, The Exiles, which also has many characters, um, but was totally gripping. Thank you, that's so nice. All right, so I wanna talk about how topical this book is and how the events of the past year, which you probably wouldn't have anticipated in exactly, I mean, I don't think any of us, maybe you did, but I did not anticipate the pandemic, but then the whole unfolding at the same time of BLM and all the, um, uh, the turmoil and agitation, the right-wing stuff and the, and the protest movement on the left, um, it feels like your book is so relevant to the times. And I think Jenna hinted at that too. Um, talk about that a little bit about you wrote it, you know, in the past few years, and then it, you lived through 2020 with all this stuff happening. How did you process that in terms of this novel? Yeah, you know, I'll I'll say that all of the the questions and themes of the book have been important to me for a very long time, um, and the book begins with a loss and an act of violence. And I was interested in that because so often we focus on the incident itself, like questions and specifics of the, the incident of violence. And we don't see as fully the life that was in progress um, and the life that was interrupted and all of the lives touched by that life. Um, and so, you know, this book begins with a tragedy in part because I wanted that tragedy to become more than an incident or a headline or a moment in the news. And the news becomes important to this book and headlines and the ways we talk about um, mm -hmm. and talk about violence. Mm -hmm. um, and that the effects and the loss reverberate over the years and affect many, many lives. They affect children, they affect the spouses of those children when they're adults, they affect friends and communities. Um, so, you know, I, I hope that the book will speak to people in this moment, um, but I do think that 
all of the issues sort of at the center of it um, have been urgent for a long time. They have been. I mean, but that's one of the difficult things about writing fiction. Um, and, you know, James Baldwin has talked about this and many people have talked about it, uh, about um, how to convey sort of political p passion ideas or even just social ideas without being didactic or without preaching or without there being a sort of easy solution. How did you avoid those kinds of pitfalls? Yeah. Those well, I think that part of it is having a large cast of characters who all approach the questions at hand in different ways. Um, yeah. So so Jade, um, in getting to know Jade, the reader can see a woman who is working hard to create opportunities for her son, and she can see all the things that her son is up against. So systemic racism um, and also a very difficult family history. Um, and then we also get to meet Lacey May, who's a woman who feels that she has thwarted potential um, and has been very busy as a wife and a mother and um, hasn't been able to go as far in life as she might have liked, even if she doesn't quite know what she might have done with that life. And then she wants to hoard opportunity for her girls. So we come to know her. And then we also see the ways that she marshals sort of racist ideas and circulation to support that position. Um, and I think that there might be a temptation to see Lacey May as an extreme figure, but I actually think her arguments are one, ones that many different people might make to support their choices, whether it's a belief in fairness or simply saying, I want what's best for my kids, what's wrong with that? Um, and so I think the characters make the stances on the issues feel real and personal. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, all right, I, I know they want me to open up for questions, but I'm gonna ask you a couple more and then people please um, add questions to the question, ask a question part, because I know Naima will be happy to answer anything. I can ask you a million more questions if we don't get any, but um, I see there are already a few. Um, so when I'm working on a novel, I often, um, there are often one or two books that I've sort of, they're almost like talismanic. I, I, when I was writing a book called Bird in Hand, a novel called Bird in Hand, I was obsessed with the hours. It had nothing to do with my novel in terms of plot or anything, but it was something about the structure and the language that helped me um, mm. so even in some ways, uh, write that book. And I wondered if there are some novelists or some writers that you've read, that you read while you were writing this book that had an influence on you. There, there were, and they were actually novelists that I ended up teaching so that I could think yeah. about the books also in my teaching. Um, a Visit from the Goon Squad by Jennifer Egan was actually really helpful to me um, as a book. That That's well, it's saying. a... It's a novel, but it's put together with all of these different parts um, and is even more nonlinear and um, complicated in its structure than what's mine and yours. But I looked at that book to see how it came together from beginning to end, just to have a sense for how to build a book like this. Um, and I did the same thing with The Dew Breaker by Edwidge Danticat, um, which um, some might say is a connection of related or associated stories. Um, I think that it's sort of marketed as a novel, but it's another book that's sort of like a mosaic of all of these different characters. And it's also, I think, more complicated structurally than mine, but I read that, see how it held together. And yeah. then I read Days of Abandonment by Elena Ferrante, who I love. I love that book so much. I've read that yeah. three times. Yeah, it's so um, good. And it's just so, it's so wild. The taste of it, yeah. Yeah, and just totally unrestrained wild emotion. And I kind of read it to give myself permission to write characters with big unwieldy emotions who go to places that feel heightened but I think not melodramatic. And so to think about how to write a book that feels wild. I can see all of those books. 
in your book. I can see that. Um, and the 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 emotion and the staying close to the bone with your characters and really diving under the surface of what they're feeling and then the complicated structure. When you were looking at those books for structure, did you actually like outline anything or, or write anything? Did you pay attention to that? I because did. One of the by that that Saunders does, and I want to ask you how you did that. Is he'll he makes no qualms about tearing apart a Russian story and actually outlining it like line by line or paragraph by paragraph. And I have done that a number of times. It's been incredibly helpful to do. So how did you do that? Yeah, you know, it doesn't it doesn't sound particularly sexy or glamorous, but I do I do a lot of planning and like planning arcs for individual characters, planning arcs for relationships, planning what kinds of questions will be asked and answered and then asked again over the course of the book. Um, and I encourage my students to do this as well. And I'll, I'll share a quick story. I once had the opportunity to interview Kerry Washington um, for a profile I was writing about her. And she shared this wonderful insight about craft. And, and she said that she likes using she loves craft, she loves structure, because it gives room for her unconscious to come and play. Um, and I feel that way sort of about planning. Like the more that I imagine for myself, the more freedom I have when I actually sit down to write and I can make discoveries. And you know, I love the way she put it, that the unconscious can then sort of show up to play when there's some structure in place. I feel like that's really true. And in college, I wrote poetry, not fiction so much. And when you write formal poetry, I was studying with John Hollander, who's like the old white, you know, guy on a hill um, who's been there for a million years. And he's very serious about structure. So I was writing Sestinas and all these very formal styles of poetry. And what I learned is that um, within structure, creativity can flourish um, in this pretty profound way. And that's exactly what you're saying. And I, I've always appreciated that. And I think I brought that to fiction writing as well, that, you know, if you can, because, because what I'm really interested in is language and character, but you got to have a story that, that is compelling and that moves ahead. And so having models for that, I think is really useful. Anyway, I don't mean to go on and on. No, no, I'm um, with you. <laughs> um, no, I'm, anyway, okay. So, well, I'm over my time. It's now 741. So I guess we should open up to audience questions. Yeah, what are your questions? Yeah, um, it looks like we've gotten a few questions so far. So let's just jump right in. So Caitlin asks, what made you decide to set the novel in the Piedmont region of North Carolina? Um, I, I lived in North Carolina um, for for a few years, for three years. And when I landed in North Carolina, I was interested in many different things. I was interested in the land, sort of like the landscape of the triangle and wanted to write about it. I found, I lived in Durham and I thought it was just beautiful. Um, and I wanted to write about the land. Um, I was also really interested in um, this idea that Durham is a city with no racial majority, which if they're, if they're Durham folks um, here, you probably have heard that or, or, or have said that to someone. And I was interested in how diverse places um, still contain inequality um, and separation. And New York City, where I am now, is certainly such a place as well. Um, and I wanted to write about that as well. And I also think it was just sort of like the emotional, it was the place I was in as I was sorting through questions of motherhood and, and pregnancy and marriage. And so the, you know, the themes of that time in my life when I was in North Carolina um, ended up in a novel in some ways set in the place where they were important to me. Yeah, as somebody who grew up in Durham, um, I feel like it's such an example of a place where, you know, diversity is so apparent everywhere you go, but there's also such inequality and segregation. Um, so it really forms the perfect kind of um, setting for something, for a work like this, where you can explore those things. 
Um, mm -hmm. The question here from Carl who says, why did you decide to read the piece you did um, that you read us earlier? Yeah, well, I was thinking about, I was thinking about the character of Ray um, and his dreams. I was thinking about how this is a book that begins with dreams um, and uh, dreams that after you read the first chapter, you'll see um, become lost. And then the question of the rest of the book is, well, like, what's our dream now? What do we, what reasons do we find for living? So that's for, for Jade and for G. Um, but it's also for Lacey May and her family who have a different kind of loss um, with, with Robbie and you know this book has two two fathers who um, come on hard circumstances and it sh they that provides the shape I think for the whole book or the reckoning for the whole book. Um, I have a question here from Emily who says I'd love to know what parts of this book felt hard to write and why and what parts felt easier and how you feel about those sections respectively now that you have some distance from actually writing it? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Hi, Emily. Um, I, I think that the hardest part of writing this book was writing the character of G. Um, and at first I thought that that was because we were so different. He's a teenage boy, he's a North Carolinian, he's suffered this particular loss that I haven't. Um, but I realized that I wasn't writing as deeply into him, perhaps because a lot of things that we actually share. Um, so, you know, G and finding himself as one of the only kids of color in the high school that he attends and feels the pressure and scrutiny of that position. G also as, um, the one in his family who has an opportunity to go further. Um, he has a teacher in the book who encourages him to be a, like a torch. The teacher quotes measure for measure to him and says like, you have this opportunity, you can be exemplary, you can be a torch that casts a light for others. And he finds this, this idea that's meant to be motivating, totally crushing and burdensome. And I think that, you know, sort of without meaning to, I had put him in a position that was quite familiar to me. And I think once I realized that, um, it gave me permission to examine what was inside of me and then also imagine more widely, it sort of cracked the book open. And so it was the hardest part of writing the book and also the part that I'm most proud of. And then what came more readily was writing all of the mothers. So writing the frustrations and desires of the mothers, um, Jade and Lacey May, and then, you know, one of the daughters as she gets older, that sort of all felt very familiar and accessible to me. Yeah, you were writing, you, you mentioned you, you began writing um, while you were pregnant, is that right? Um, do you feel like you were able to sort of tap into motherhood, um, like, being pregnant versus once you had had your child, um, did your experience of writing as a mother or writing motherhood change? Yeah, it did. I mean, I think that um, I I spoke about this a little bit recently. Um, I was lucky to speak with Audie Cornish for, for NPR, um, which was exciting. And I told her this story. So um, I, I, all of the postpartum experiences that were in this book, I didn't realize were idealized until after, until I actually had a child myself <laughs> and had to go back and revise them. Um, and you know, I think I, I I focused so much on sort of what we hope to emotionally recuperate with motherhood, even if we didn't have a difficult relationship with our parents, sort of the idea of creating your own family and something new and your dreams for your life. Um, that I was very interested in. And I thought less about some of the difficult, like physical and emotional realities of being a new mom. So I definitely made all of the new moms or the moms remembering that postpartum time much more tired. Um, but also I was able to write a little <laughs> bit more about the pressure and the difficulty of managing sort of one's own life and emotions while also caring for a child, you know, sort of still having to do that work of caring for yourself 
um, and having your own difficult feelings while also tending to a child with very urgent needs was much more plugged into that reality after having a baby. Christina, do you want to jump in with any other questions? Um, it looks like sure. we have any more audience ones, but I'll, I'll let you know if we get a few more. Okay, and so we'll go another few minutes. Sure, yeah. Okay, okay, great. Um, yes, I wanted to ask you about this gorgeous cover and the title, What's Mine and Yours. So can you talk a little bit about how this happened and what you like about it and also um, what the cover, what the title sort of means to you in the book? Yeah. Well, I love I love the color of the cover, just all of these sort of like sunset colors that together seem to be something like a very large horizon and then the the silhouette of a city. Um, I think that it's it's beautiful and it's warm, but it's also not particularly cheery. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's moody and sophisticated, and I love that. Um, and absolutely love all of the different silhouettes. My husband thought they were clouds when I first showed him <laughs> the cover. And I like that there's, it's sort of unclear until you yeah, look more hard closely. To tell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, until you look more closely that they're, they're forms, they're people. Um, and the title, I'll, I'll be honest, I, I didn't come up with it. I had a different title um, for the book and it was my brilliant editor who suggested the title. Um, what was your title? Mine was didn't never know, um, which I liked because it was idiomatic um, mm -hmm. and sort of tangled and musical. And the book is so much about what people can't see or don't know um, about themselves, about their loved ones and how that interferes with their relationships. But it's hard to say. <laughs> it's, a hard, it's a hard title to say. Um, and uh, I, 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 I love what's mine and yours. It's drawn from a line of, me of Measure for Measure, which is the school play um, that brings together G and Noel in the novel. And it's deceptive, I think, in some ways. What's mine and yours seems to suggest some sort of connection and intimacy yeah. when you first read it. But if you look at it again, there's also the possibility of separation there and division. Um, and the book is so much about ownership and entitlement, whether it's ownership of a home or entitlement to a school and education that the struggles over what each person is entitled to are at the heart of the book. So my editor is, is brilliant and very good. And I'm so grateful to her for thinking That's of this. Wonderful. So we've got some great comments. So Leslie Lindsay, who's just amazing book blogger and active person online, who's I feel like has become a sort of virtual friend. And I hope you'll befriend her as well, Naima, if you haven't already. Um, but she says, I have to agree about the cover. It's stunning, um, but it tells a story. And you're right. It's got the it's got this wonderful skyline and the faces, but it's cloud like and all of that works so well together. And by the way, um, Gina Siliberto, did you know her? At yeah, I did. Yeah, Here she is. And Hi, she's Gina. so wonderful. And we've stayed in touch. Hi, Gina. And she says, was your title, and I have the same question, actually, was your title no, N-O, or K-N-O-W? No. K-N-O-W, no. Got it. And, yeah. And that, wasn't, it's, yeah. Yeah. And it's a line that appears at some point in the book. And, and I think that that's right. But it's yeah. a line that appears in the book. I actually like it, but I, I can totally see this. And that, I think that's just wonderful. Perfect. Um, okay. So do we have All a couple right. more? Oh, yeah. I have a couple more talk. audience questions. Um, oh, good. If you don't mind. Um, so Sharon asks, what do you hope readers take away from the book? Well, as a novelist, I... I hope that there are many things that will resonate with different people. I have no sort of single takeaway. Um, I hope mm -hmm. that the book will be able to connect in many different ways and perhaps even in ways that I couldn't expect. I will say something that is important to me is an idea in the book, which is that even our smallest choices have the power to change who we are. 
and shape our lives. So whether that's the choice to stand up for or show up for your child, that's a big choice, or a smaller choice, like G's choice to participate in the school play. Um, mm -hmm. It's a small thing that he does in some ways, but it's transformative for him. And he's a young man who has a lot of shame and self-doubt, who's living with his trauma, but he's able to do something that's quite remarkable, which is get up on a stage and recite Shakespeare and hang out with the kids at his new school and share about his life in ways that are vulnerable. And all of those small choices are part of what make him who he is. And it's true for the other child at the center of the novel, Noelle, Lacey May's daughter as well, who befriends G and stands up to her mother and seeks other surrogate mother figures. Those sort of small choices that they make when they're very young have tremendous consequences. And so I hope that um, readers will find sort of power in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, I like that. Um, and then a question from Andrea, which actually ties into what I like to ask authors at the end of events anyway. So this is for both of you. What are you both working on now? And a sort of parallel question is, what are you reading right now? So right, what are you writing? What are you reading? Christina, do you wanna do you wanna start? Do you wanna share? Sure. It? I'll just I'll just say that um, I wanted to write. I thought I would write a contemporary novel next, but a family story that took place in Civil War era North Carolina, where my half of my family is from, is um, what I'm working on now, unfortunately, because the Civil War is a disaster of a topic. It's so huge. And it also is the people who study it are so intense about it that mm -hmm. um, you know you have to be really careful. And, and, and there's, it's, it's overwhelming, but um, but anyway, that's what I'm working on. And as I told you, I'm reading the George. I'm reading a lot right now. I'm reading the George Saunders book. Um, I just read this, The Pull of the Stars. You can see I got it from my local library in Southwest oh, Harbor, Maine. Oh, oh. um, this is the um, Emma Donahue book that is about. Um, it is about uh, the it, Irish flu in, in 1918 that was a lot like what we're going through now with COVID. So that's interesting. Mm. And I'm doing a keynote with this amazing woman, Avni Doshi. And this she um, she was shortlisted for the Booker Prize. And it's called Burnt Sugar, this novel. It's really wonderful. So that's what I'm reading. Except for your, besides <laughs> <Yeah. this. laughs> What about you? Um, I just started Liberty by Caitlin Greenidge, a uh, historical fiction novel. I love Caitlin Greenidge's work. I think she's brilliant. Um, I love her mind. Um, and I'm, I've been waiting to read this book for about a year and I just got it. So I'm excited to read that. I've recently read and loved Milk Blood Heat by Dantiel mm -hmm. Moniz, the debut short story collection, sort of about girlhood, womanhood, embodiment rage, strong feelings, desire. Um, and I love Patricia Engel's Infinite Country, which also came out today. Um, wow. and, uh, yeah, and is a Reese's book club pick and it's just marvelous. And it's about um, a Colombian American family divided by deportation and their journey to find their way back to one another. Um, and in terms of what I'm working on, if this is in the in the planning dreaming stage, um, at least for a little while longer. Um, I am working on my third novel about two longtime friends who decide to move to be near one another when they're both pregnant so that they can raise their children together. Um, but in doing that, they have to confront the ways that their lives have taken divergent paths. So one of them is quite wealthy and is in a passionless marriage and has a great professional success, but uh, a big secret that she's working hard to conceal. And the other woman is largely alone in the caring for her child when she has that child um, and is broke. And so it's a book about female friendship and class mobility and the ways that all of the issues between two people really come to the surface um, when they have children. That sounds amazing. And just a quick question. 
are you under contract or are you writing this? Are you just going to go off and do that? Like how, yeah. how is it working? Yeah. So I'm on, I'm under contract in the UK um, because uh, my UK publisher, when they bought the rights for what's mine and yours happened to ask if I had a third novel and I said, I sure do. Um, so, so that's exciting. And then we'll, we'll see what happens on the U S side with it, but I'm, I'm committed to it as my next project. Sounds amazing. Thanks. Sounds all right. So, what an honor! How great yeah. it's been. Oh, we have a for me. Shortly, um, I just want to give a few quick reminders. Um, please check out our full events calendar by clicking on our um, little icon above our faces. Um, also, you could find it at crowdcast.io/flyleafbooks. And um, if you're interested in buying. What's mine and yours? If you haven't already, um, you can buy it from Flyleaf. We have signed book plates by Naima. Um, we also have copies of The Exiles, Orphan Train, Peace of the World, other books by Christina Baker Klein um, on our shelves right now. Please, please support these authors. They are wonderful and we are so appreciative of them joining us tonight. Thank you both so much and thank you everyone who's watching. Thank you so much. Thank you, Talia. Thank you, Christina. And thanks to everyone who joined. Thank you. And congratulations again on the release of What's Mine and Yours today. It's been such a treat having you on Pub Day. Thank you so thanks. much. Bye, y'all. Bye.